Okay, here we go. I'd like to begin by thanking everyone for joining me for this talk today. And before we jump into the content, I'll share just a little bit about my background. Again, my name is Mandy Wise, and I've been doing full stack development with GraphQL for four years now, and I currently work as a solutions architect at Apollo. And in addition to that, I've also authored and co-authored a couple of books about GraphQL. And today, I am very excited to share with you a solution for using subscriptions alongside a federated data graph. And to that end, we'll begin by discussing what Apollo Federation is and what's currently possible in its related open source libraries. Then we'll explore why it's architecturally beneficial to think about subscription operations as a separate concern from other operations executed against a data graph. And lastly, we'll see how we can build a decoupled subscription service that integrates with the federated data graph schema. So let's begin with Apollo Federation. Federation has been around for a couple years now, and since its release, it has allowed us to get a lot closer to realizing the dream of designing and building distributed GraphQL architectures that are both maintainable and that can easily facilitate cross-team collaboration. Specifically, Federation allows teams to embrace separation of concerns so that they can work on different products and features that are powered by a single data graph and they can do this work without stepping on each other's toes. And on top of that, Apollo Gateway takes a declarative approach to composing subgraphs together and handles query planning for us, so we don't have to deal with the imperative pain points of other approaches to designing distributed GraphQL architectures. So that means that backend teams can independently manage their portions of the data graph while still exposing a single GraphQL endpoint to client developers. And at the moment, this works well for query and mutation operations. But out of the box, Apollo Federation doesn't support subscription operations. Now, before we jump down the rabbit hole of how a federated data graph may be extended to support those subscription operations, I think there's an important question to consider. And I would say it's an important question to answer for both federated and non-federated data graphs alike. And that question is whether subscriptions are truly the right way to support the real-time feature that you need to implement. Today, there are many popular GraphQL servers and other libraries that support subscriptions, and the barriers to getting up and running with them are relatively low, which is great. And many of these popular GraphQL subscription implementations typically use WebSockets as a transport layer. But there's no such thing as a full duplex free lunch. For example, maintaining an open socket connection to receive updates from a subscription operation will have non-trivial battery implications for mobile devices. So before you add the subscription type to any GraphQL schema, it's worth asking if polling for less frequent updates or using push notifications on mobile would be a more suitable solution. But let's say for your use case that subscriptions are the right technical answer. At this point, we'll turn our attention to leveraging what's available in Apollo Gateway to support those subscription operations against your federated data graph, and we'll do so in a way that, for clients, will feel as seamless as it does with a monolithic GraphQL API. So turning our attention back to our federated data graph, it's important to note that a key feature of Apollo Federation is that it was designed to support decoupled and distributed GraphQL architectures. However, the stateless nature of the HTTP transport layer that usually supports query and mutation operations on the graph may not need to scale in the same way that stateful WebSocket connections need to. But in a standard approach to implementing subscriptions for a GraphQL API, we often end up coupling these two transport concerns together. So in the spirit of decoupling, ideally our federated data graph would remain as the stateless execution engine of the API. And alongside it, we could have a separate and dedicated subscription service that's responsible for maintaining the stateful connections with clients, as well as processing and responding to those requests. So in this scenario, the stateless and stateful transport-related concerns of the graph can be scaled independently. But this proposed architecture then leads us to some very practical and important questions. For example, 
If the subscriptions are managed in a separate service and Apollo Federation doesn't directly integrate with subscriptions yet, then how do you use the same types that are defined in the federated data graph as output types for subscription fields? And how will subscription operations resolve additional data that isn't provided in the message payload that was published by a subgraph? And lastly, if the type definitions from the federated data graph are included in the subscription services schema, how will backend teams keep the schemas in sync between the graph router and the subscription service without amassing large amounts of technical debt or other overhead? Well, I should be able to provide some answers to those questions. The separate subscription service will be responsible for defining a subscription type only, but under the hood, we will automatically incorporate all of the type definitions from the federated data graph into the schema so that any of these types may be used as output types for those subscription fields. In doing so, client developers can write subscription operations in a way that reflects the natural relationships between the types in your federated data graph. And from the client's perspective, it will appear as though they are running these subscription operations directly against the same data graph that they are also running query and mutation operations against, because in essence, that's exactly what they're doing. And from the subgraph developer's perspective, they will be able to publish subscription-related messages to a shared PubSub implementation, just as they would for a monolithic GraphQL API. And then within the subscription service, subscription type definitions and resolvers may be configured exactly as they would be for any GraphQL API, but while using output types that are defined in the federated data graph. So to explore this solution in more depth, let's imagine the following scenario. We're going to build a live blog powered by Apollo Federation, and this data graph will have an author service and a post service. And for this live blog, we'll need a single subscription operation to push new posts to subscribe clients immediately as those posts become available. And in addition to the basic post data, we will also need to traverse the graph to provide some related author details in the subscription response as well. So let's explore the basic setup in a bit more depth. There are four main architectural components we'll concern ourselves with here. First, the graph router and its subgraphs. We'll also have our decoupled subscription service, and we'll have a Redis instance. And lastly, an Apollo client-powered React app. Now, the post subgraph will publish post added messages to Redis after a new post is created in a mutation. And the subscription service will subscribe to those same post added messages from Redis. And the subscription service may occasionally need to make calls over to the graph router to fetch additional data needed to fully resolve a post added subscription operation. And then the new post data will be pushed down to the client via a WebSocket connection. Now, we use Redis PubSub for subscriptions here instead of a basic in-memory PubSub implementation because any of the subgraph services may need to publish messages to Redis while the subscription service will need to be able to receive those same messages. And we can easily imagine that these services may be running in completely different containers. So for this scenario, we'll use GraphQL Redis subscriptions. In our post service, it's worth noting that we are referencing an author entity from an author subgraph to use as the author field on the post type. And we're referencing that author based on its ID key field. And we also have an add post mutation, which is where we'll need to publish a, metis, uh, a message to Redis about a new post's availability. And over in the post resolvers, we do exactly that inside of an add post resolver. Publishing a post added message with a payload containing some of the new post data, but we don't include anything in that payload about the post author apart from its ID. Now, zipping over to the subscription service, the type definitions that we manually define here will only contain the subscription type as well as any fields we want to add to that type. However, because we're going to merge the types from the federated data graph into the schema in just a moment, we'll be able to use those types defined in the federated data graph as output types for the subscription fields, even though they are not explicitly defined here. 
So in this case, we use the post type that is owned by the post subgraph. Now, this is where things start to get really interesting. So to get the schema for the federated data graph, we can instantiate an Apollo Gateway object directly in the subscription service. And in this example, we're using managed federation. So there would be an Apollo key variable set in the environment, and we don't need to provide a service list option in its config. It's also worth noting that this gateway is a little bit different from what we're used to seeing because we're not going to pass this gateway directly into an Apollo server. We will, however, set an on schema change option for that gateway that will take the gateway schema and incorporate it with the subscription services type definitions and the resolvers to make an executable schema for the service to run its subscription operations against. And the on schema change option will run whenever the gateway pulls Apollo Studio for the schema and it detects a change. Now, over in the resolvers for our subscription fields, we'll also set up a client to access the shared Redis instance, just as we did in the post service. But here we listen for post added messages instead. And if all we ever needed to do was resolve data that's available in the message payload provided by the post service, then this would be the end of the story for us. But that payload doesn't include the author details we need, or for that matter, any other data about the new post that may be queried when using that node as an entry point to the graph. So we'll need some way to resolve that additional data whenever it is requested by clients. So to illustrate what we have to work with when a new post added message is received, we can see here what field values are available in the payload and what we still need to resolve from the federated data graph to fully resolve the complete operation. And there are a couple of different ways we could approach this. For one, we could define resolvers on the post type on a per field basis in the subscription service to fetch data from the gateway for any of these additional fields that the client may request. But this may not be very efficient in terms of network requ requests, and it may not be very future-proof either as the graph continues to evolve. So I'll suggest a more maintainable approach that we can take, which is to leverage the generic resolve method inside of the resolver for the post added subscription field, because this method will allow us to intercept the payload and do whatever we need to do to it before resolving the operation. So here, we can create a data source that's capable of diffing the provided payload fields with the actual field selections in the operation, and then query the federated data graph for just those missing fields in a single request. So what this approach ultimately enables is that as long as the data source provides a mechanism to fetch a single post from the federated data graph, then the post can be used as an entry point to all other relationships it has with other nodes in the graph, and thus fully resolve all of the data that's required for the subscription operation. Great. So with that code in place, the last step is to fire up a WebSocket server to use as an endpoint to send the subscription operations to. And one option that we can use for this is the GraphQL WS library. And using this library's use server function, we can set the gateway data source on the context so that it's available to all of the resolvers. And we may also wish to set additional context here too, such as a token retrieved from the connection params if authentication is involved. And importantly for our purposes, we would use the onsubscribe callback here to set the execution arguments for each subscription, including the current value of the schema variable we previously set in the gateway objects on schema change method. And lastly, in the onsubscribe callback, we can optionally return a GraphQL error if a client tries to send a query or mutation operation to this WebSocket powered endpoint instead of the HTTP endpoint for the federated data graph. So on a final note, let's talk about what this means for clients. And the good news is that as far as subscriptions are concerned, it's going to be business as usual for them. The most important thing is that when a client creates a WebSocket link, that link will point to the endpoint for the subscription service that we just set up. And then the HTTP link will point directly to the gateway endpoint as usual. And from there, the client can direct traffic as needed using Apollo client split function.
Now, to wrap up, I'd like to quickly cover off some considerations and cross-cutting concerns to keep in mind when you implement the solution. First, this solution requires all subscription fields to be defined in a single decoupled subscription service. So that may necessitate that ownership of the service is shared across teams that manage independent portions of the schema that are applicable to queries and mutations. Second, some level of coordination would be necessary to ensure that event labels, such as the post added label, are synchronized between the subgraphs that publish events and the subscription service that calls the async iterator, iterator method with these labels as arguments, because breaking changes may occur without such coordination. Third, to improve real-time performance and minimize the number of requests from the subscri subscription service back to the gateway to resolve those non-payload fields, some form of caching would likely be desirable. And further, you may perhaps also encourage client developers to avoid overfetching data in their subscription operations and leverage the Apollo client cache wherever possible. Lastly, Removing a type from the federated data graph when the subscription service uses that type as an output type for one of its fields will be a breaking change unless this type removal happens simultaneously between both the subscription service and the gateway. So good schema governance practices are a must, and it would also be a good idea to lean on your observability tooling here to understand what operations are being executed against your federated data graph from the subscription service. Now, some of the code examples I shared today were truncated for brevity's sake, so I've included a full working example of this pattern in this repo. And this repo also contains reference implementations to all of the utilities that I shared today, such as the make subscription schema function, the add gateway data source to subscription context function, and the gateway data source base class too. And with that, I'd like to say thank you so much for joining me for this talk today, and I'd be happy to take some questions now.